And Father, have your way with us as we open your word tonight. Uh, speak to our hearts how we need you, Lord. Uh, in the days that we're in and in the times that we're in, with the condition of our heart the way it is, Lord, we need you uh, just to change us and to continue to change us. So have your way, Lord, and help us to be open to let you. Uh, we know you won't do anything against our will, so may our will be yours, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Acts chapter 11. Uh, if you remember, uh, Peter has <laughs> seen the sheet drop down out of heaven, and uh, he then he came to a place of going in with the Gentiles and entering in and even eating with them. Uh, staying with them in <laughs> uh, now coming back to Jerusalem uh, in chapter 11 we see some conflict going on uh, but Peter here is so gracious in the midst of it uh, uh, but as, as we start out it says in, in verse 1 of chapter 11 and the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God uh, so news travels fast even without phones uh, and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. So those that were circumcised, the Jews, came and, and contended with him, saying, You went in to men uncircumcised, and you did eat with them. <laughs> uh, so, so really it was just a dietary thing that they were coming against, uh, as well as him in the flesh being with, with those that were uh, once called dogs. Uh, they would call the, the Gentiles or the unbelievers dogs that were just fuel for the fire of hell. Uh, but seeing something different that was going on, uh, uh, you went in with them and you did eat with them. And, and just what a picture. Here's an apostle uh, just going in and doing what God had called him to do what God had ministered to him. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that as he comes here, he doesn't rebuke them and say, hey, I'm an apostle. you got to listen to me. you got to do what I'm saying. you, you got to be, behave because uh, I'm higher than you are. There was none of that going on. Uh, it was just a picture of him having grace for the folks that were there that just didn't have an understanding of what God was doing. Uh, and so often we, we can think that we're so far above folks, and we see the picture of that uh, uh, in the States and in other places of, of people thinking that they're higher than others and that they have more privilege, and there is none of that going on. And Peter's such a great example here because he, he, he's gotten a hold of the grace that God had given him. Uh, and in that grace, he didn't rebuke them. He just told them what God had showed him but also showed him by the word of God which came to him what was happening. So it's always going to be by the word and by the grace that we've received that we can minister one to another, that, that we're not above anybody. We were in the same place once, needing help and needing instruction, needing uh, to know what, what God was doing and, and needing to be encouraged in that. And, and Peter's just showing that so wonderfully. Uh, not, not raising himself above and saying, hey, I'm an apostle, just bow down to me, kiss my ring, and, and we'll go on from there. But but just being in that place of just allowing them to have the, their heart ministered to by him. And boy, sometimes that, that, that ruffles us. Instead of getting defensive, which we do, right? The better we know people, the quicker we're, we're defensive with them, right? <laughs> Uh, how dare you talk to me like that? What do you think I am? You're supposed to be my cheerleader, and here you are attacking me. You know, just no. Uh, we, we've got to get by that, and boy, I've got to get by that. I've got to let the word come to me and minister to me and, and just show me what the truth of my situation is. And he does that by the word of God and by the grace of God, the two things that we need uh, so much in our lives and he's bringing that back to the church uh, as he comes out from the gentiles and, and can you imagine isn't it always the way of the enemy when something wonderful is going on we come back and we get confronted with something that just knocks us right down it just knocks it right out of us <laughs> we're so excited about what's going on like chris coming back from israel she gets off the plane and she's back in the u.s 
how deflating that is. <laughs> you know, here we are. We're on the mountaintop, and all of a sudden we end up in the valley. And boy, that that can be somewhat deflating at times, but also encouraging because that's the place where we can grow the most. Because when we're on the mountaintop, uh, we're above the timber line on the mountaintops. There is no trees. There is no growth. There is nothing going on. It's just a mountaintop experience. But the real valley times are the place where we grow the most. The mountain times are wonderful, but the valley times are necessary. We need to have those times where we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of who he is. But we do it by the word of God and by the grace of God. And so he, he it says in verse 4, but Peter, <clears throat> excuse me, rehearsed the matter from the beginning. He told them what was going on and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descended, uh, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. I, I think he's sitting there, and he's even amazed that God did that for him. And sometimes we want the things of God so much that, that we just kind of blow off the other things that have already happened. Uh, we're walking miracles. And, and, and we look at it and we go, God, your grace is so amazing that you would even pour that out to us and show us that we needed salvation and then to provide a way for us is even more amazing. You just have given us so much and blessed us so much. We have heat in our homes. I remember Pastor Bill once uh, when we were down at the castle and, and he was talking and, and he had just come back from uh, Nepal uh, and he was in a place teaching over there uh, and he said it was just a little hut that they were in but they had come for, for miles and walked through the cold and had come into this house and he said it was freezing. It was cold but they had come all this way so he was teaching uh, and he said the sun came out and he said you know what it might be better if we just stop the teaching for a minute go back outside because the sun's warmer than this hut is right now uh, and they wouldn't do it and he said why not and he said because we're afraid that if we get out in the sun we'll fall asleep and we want to stay awake so we'd rather stay here in the cold and stay awake and listen to you just oh, that's a heart that wants the things of the Lord is the deer pants for the water brooks. So my soul longs after you. The things that you have for me, the things that you desire for me are the things that I want. Uh, Peter just amazed that the Lord would even do this to him. And we should be amazed that the Lord would even do that. You know, the Psalm says, uh, what is man that you're even mindful of us? Oh, Lord, we're just nothing. We're just little ants compared to what you have. And yet you, you, you condescend to us and minister to us. You're so gracious to us, Lord. It came even to me. And he said, upon the witch, when I had fastened my eyes on it, it wasn't that he just glanced at it. He fastened his eyes on the thing that God was showing him so that he could get every bit of what God wanted to speak to him. And boy, I, I need that when I'm reading the word in the morning sometimes, you know, just sitting in front of the fireplace or hearing it crackle, and, and sometimes we get, just get so distracted by the comforts that, that we miss fastening our eyes on what God wants to say to us. We're, we're in circumstances where we're distracted from God, and uh, instead of seeing what he's doing in the midst of it, we get distracted by what's going on around us instead of seeing him in the middle of it and, and just rejoicing in what he's doing. Uh, Peter said, it came to me, and when I saw it, I fastened my eyes. I, I clamped down on those things and just took a real good focus at what God was doing, and I considered it. And I saw a four-footed beast of the earth and the wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. You know what it doesn't say? is that Peter was amazed by the voice. The Lord tells us that my sheep know my voice, and they hear me. He knew the voice that he was listening to, and he heard it and paid attention to it. And isn't it something? We, we can be in a crowd and talking, and everybody talking in different directions, but if your name is mentioned in that crowd, you hear it, don't you? You're talking to somebody, and somebody else 
mentions your name in your ear automatically goes, <laughs> I hear my name. What are they saying about me? <laughs> it depends on the people that are talking about us, right? It's either going to be good or bad, but hey, they're talking about us. Uh, but he heard that voice. He knew the voice that was there. He knew the voice that was speaking to him. And I said, not so Lord, and we went over this last time, you know, you don't say that to the Lord. You don't say not so, Lord. <laughs> Those three words just don't go together. Not so and Lord just don't go in the same sentence together. <laughs> For nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. Uh, the, the Lord told him, I want you to take these things. I'm changing things in your life. I'm changing things around you. I'm, I'm changing your circumstances. I'm going to change your your condition. And as I'm doing that, I want you to pay attention to me, Peter. Because even in the middle of this, I've got something for you. For the longest time, Peter wouldn't even consider eating bacon. Poor guy. <laughs> See what he missed? Uh, all those years of missing bacon. Uh, bacon is a, a meal all in itself. You know, it's just wonderful. Uh, but for the longest time, he wouldn't even consider paying attention to anything like that it would offend him but the lord said is really sitting there saying i don't want you to be offended anymore i want you to be engaged james talks about it when somebody comes into the church and they're in rich clothing and they're famous they have a name you put them in the front of the church so that everybody can see them and boy our hearts go there don't they and everybody talks when those people come in at one of the churches we were at one sunday morning one of the uh, local TV station uh, people, one of the anchors, came into church and, and sat down, and everybody knew who it was. And all the talk was, mm, look who's here. Did you see who's here? Instead of God's here. Who's more important, a TV anchor or God being present? Mm. <laughs> Isn't it amazing where our hearts go when we see somebody famous or rich? Instead of knowing that God is over them and pay more attention to him than we do them. And Peter sitting there seeing this thing come down and yet not wanting to be offended by it because God was doing something. But, but really fighting with that battle that was there. And we, we have these battles in our flesh and we're going to have those constantly, aren't we? Those battles till we go home. Because the Lord is going to show us things about our flesh till the day that we go home that our flesh is fighting against the spirit. That's just the natural way things go. We, this natural man wants to fight against everything spiritual. And there's not one part of you in you that won't fight against the spiritual thing that's coming to you. And you may think, well, I have victory over that now. <laughs> He's going to reveal things to you that you thought you never would see in yourself. And yet every part of us fights against the things of the Lord. And the Lord has to continue to change those things in us. And we're seeing it in, in a live scene here with Peter as the sheet comes down from heaven. He, he says, I'm okay with you, Lord, right? You came back. You restored me after I rejected you at the cross. You restored me. Everything's cool. We're good now. Yes, Lord. I'm saying yes to you, Lord. And he says, good. Let me show you your heart. And he says, what? Not so, Lord. <laughs> Amazing. The, the moment that we think that we've got things together, he says, ah, you don't have anything together. <laughs> the only thing you got together is you think you're okay, but I'm here to tell you you're not okay. You need me. And those things are meant to point us to him and for us to go to him all the time. Why do you think you get in the grocery store and you get in the line and you always get behind the person that has a check that doesn't go through? In the line next to you, 44 people go through before you get up to the line. And you were the second in line. Why do you think that is? Because God is showing you your heart is in a wrong place. Not only are your feet in the wrong place, but your heart's in the wrong place. <laughs> and he, he allows those things. And sometimes he does those things just to show us how much we need him. And we need him in everything. There isn't one thing that goes on in your life that you don't need Jesus for. <sighs> Peter says, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean at any time has entered into my, out, my mouth. And the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed, that call, call not thou common. And this was done three times. 
and all were and all was drawn up again into heaven. Uh, as he finished the work, he drew it back up into heaven, just to then minister to Peter, and, and that was just the beginning of what was going to happen to him. And behold, immediately there were three men already come into the house where I was from Caesarea unto me, and the Spirit bade me with them, nothing doubting. Uh, go with them. Don't doubt anything about it. Just go with them. And here's a man who would never go with him, that all of a sudden the Lord says, I want you to now. Oh, this is the time for you to go because there's something that's going to happen. I need you to learn from this and I need them to learn from this. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. So we see that there was men that went with him. He took people with him just for accountability uh, and just for uh, just to make sure that everything was all right and to make sure he wasn't going to be alone. We always have to be accountable somewhere, and that's important for us. We certainly need to be accountable to our spouses if we have spouses. If we don't, we need to make ourselves accountable to somebody. And don't, just don't say you're accountable to the Lord. Certainly we are accountable to the Lord, but we need to make ourselves accountable to others too. It's an important thing to happen. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house. They entered into this man's house, in, into Cornelius' house, uh, in, and it says that he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house. This man who might not have even been a believer that was there, even though they, that the Jews raved about him, uh, we're, we're going to see here in a second that he might not have even been saved yet. But the angel showed up at his house to show him and to minister to him and to, to come to salvation. So he showed us how an angel was in his house, uh, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell you the words whereby you and all your house, notice, shall be saved. That's future tense. He may not have even been saved. He was religious. He was doing good works for the Jews. He, he was praying always, it says. <clears throat> but he may not have even been saved. See, there are very religious people who may not ha even have a relationship with the Lord. They can be religious, but not saved. Salvation needs to come. So just don't assume just because somebody's sitting in church that their salvation has already happened. And it says, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell upon them uh, as on us at the beginning. As he includes them, he, he includes himself in this, that we needed the Holy Spirit. And they found the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fell upon them just like he did with, with us when we were in the upper room. And the mighty rushing wind came through and spoke to us. Then I remembered, and it's good for us to remember the things of the Lord. It's good for us to remember what the Lord has said and what the Lord has done. I remembered the word of the Lord, how important the word is for us. How important the word is to be in us, written on the tables of our heart, in, in that place where we can draw on the strength of the word, where we can draw on the, the, the promise of the word, where we can draw on the example of the word and just put it before us. I remembered the word of the Lord, how, that how he said that John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> For as much then as God gave them like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Christ, we have already believed that's past tense. It's already happened to us. What was I that I could withstand God? As I saw God doing this, how could I withstand God and say that these men can't be saved because they're Gentiles? Did you ever have somebody in your life that, that you thought they would never get saved? They can't get saved. <laughs> They're too bad. They're too awful. And yet, how many of them have come to the Lord? How many people said that about you and I? That one? No. <laughs> They're not going to get saved. They party too much. They drink too much. They smoke too much. They swear too much. They use the Lord's name in vain too much. They can never get saved. And yet, look it. We're here. <laughs> we're walking with the Lord. What a miracle we are. And when they heard these things, they held their peace. The guys that were coming against him, as Peter used the grace of the Lord and the word of the Lord, when they heard the things that he was saying, 
when they heard the logic behind it, when they heard uh, the things that Peter had gone through to get to that place, when they heard those things, they held their peace and glorified God. It's wonderful when people, even though they're coming against you, can sit there and hear the words of what has really gone on that can change their mind and say, okay, that's right then. Mm. How hard is it for the Jews to believe that Jesus already came? The argument they still have with us every time somebody goes to Israel, you hear about it every time somebody goes, they're witnessing to the Jews and they say, you're looking for Jesus to come the second time. We're looking for him the first time. <laughs> we don't believe he ever came the first time. When we see him and he says, I was here once before, then we'll believe you. <laughs> uh, but these guys had their hearts changed had their minds changed because the word of the Lord was there and the grace of God was working. Always pray for the grace of God to work in somebody's life that's close to you. And then the word of God to minister to their hearts, to change their minds and to change their, their directions. <laughs> when they heard these things, they held their peace and they glorified God saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Notice the glory didn't go to Peter for going to the Gentiles, for listening to God. The glory went to God because it was God who saves people. It wasn't Peter that saved anybody, even though he might have been the first pope. <laughs> Wrong. He wasn't the first pope. Even though Peter was there, even though Peter was being used, it was the glory goes to the Lord. Peter wasn't looking for glory. He didn't want to touch the glory that belonged to the Lord. Moses didn't want to touch the glory that belonged to the Lord. You and I shouldn't desire the glory that belongs to the Lord. We should desire that God always gets the glory. And they looked and they said, Well, evidently God has granted repentance to the Gentiles for life, for real life, for what was going to go on. It tells us this in Ephesians 2 verse 14. It says, speaking about Jesus, For he is our peace not he was not he's gonna be he is and you and i should know the, this in these days he's our peace in the midst of where you are right now he's in the midst of us as we go to the hospital and sit there facing life-threatening things he's in the midst of us when we fight faced financial difficulties and even financial ruin as they talk about taking away social security <laughs> As they take away the dollar bill and coming up with crypto coins and all our savings will be gone and it'll be monitored by somebody else. Who's going to be your peace in the midst of that? It's got to be Jesus. Because if you're looking for a man to be your peace, you're never going to have peace. That peace will never be there. He says he is our peace in every situation that we're in, in every difficulty, in every joy. He's going to be our peace in the midst of it. He is our peace who is what? Who has made both one, both Jew and Gentile, who has made us both one. We're, we're one in him. And he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. When Jesus died on the cross, it says that the, that curtain was torn from the top to the bottom, 60 feet high, uh, a hand's breadth thick. No man could rip that. Only God could tear that. And it separated man from God. And when he died, that was torn so that we could enter in and become one with him and he with us. Can you imagine the God who created everything by speaking the world into existence came down to save you and I? from our sin and yet we have the audacity at times to say that God doesn't really love us oh, how much does he love you he gave his life for you he held out his arms so they could be nailed on a cross the God who created everything was put on the cross by something that man made nails spear put in his side made by man and yet God created everything he created them to love him and yet they killed him we should never in our hearts even think that God doesn't love me enough. He's given us everything that we need for salvation, for life. It says here in Acts that he gave them repentance 
what unto life to bring to them real life that they never had before and that's what he's done for you and i we never had life before we had death facing us from the moment we were born we were starting to die the process had begun <laughs> it's amazing we just found out we're expecting another great great grand baby and uh boy just thinking of a life coming into this world and the sweetness of it and how tiny they are how sweet they are and yet the moment they're born the process is starting for them to die unless they come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and then they'll live eternally with him oh the preciousness of that life and yet the awfulness of what the world is going to do to that little one and it breaks your heart doesn't it it just I know my brother, they, they, my brother and his wife had one child and they said they weren't going to have any more because they didn't want to bring any more kids into a world that was so awful. And we hear a lot of that. And yet these can be the ones, they could be the ones that would worship God and bring others to salvation. We don't know. Oh, but the sweetness of life. And yet we get to experience new life. And it's just like we're babies just learning to walk. I mean, do you know everything about God? Because if you do, you need to get up here and tell me. <laughs> I'll go sit down. You just come up and start telling me because I need to know. I want to know. We're just like babies growing up and learning and growing and seeing everything that God has done, seeing what the, the world has, the sun coming through, the stars in formation, just always in that place of circling. And we stand amazed at those things. I mean, when you go camping, when, when you get out away from the city and, and you look up, if your neck can do it for long enough without it breaking, you know, you just look up and you see all those billions of stars up there and you realize he knows each one of them by name. And if he knows each one of them by name, we also have to know that he knows each and every one of us by name and he loves you. And that is just so wonderful. And Peter just amazed that God would even use him to bring others to life. Amazed that he would change his heart and change his mind and change his direction. And the Lord went so far as to even put a sheet down from heaven and say, Peter, this is where you're going. This is what's going to happen in your life. You're going to change, Peter. No, I'm not, Lord. Let's it down again. Peter, you're going to change, Peter. No, I'm not, Lord. Peter, you're going to change, Peter. Okay, I'm going to change, Lord. Three times to tell him. How often has he told us, I want you to change? I don't want to, Lord. I'm too old. I don't want to, Lord. I got too much going on in my life. My job's getting in the way. I don't want to, Lord. I don't want that disease to show, to show me how much you love me. I don't want that disease so that you can show me how bad sin is. But I need to because you need to see it. So that you can love me more. So that you can see the depths of my love for you. Oh, the sweetness of that for Peter and for you and I. It says in verse 19, uh, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that, that arose about Stephen, uh, after Stephen died, and they really started persecuting the church more and more. They, they scattered all over the world. Uh, they traveled as far as Phoenicia. Uh, Phoenicia up the coast a little bit almost to Asia Minor and to Cyprus the 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 islands off the coast there into Antioch uh, a couple hundred miles away just up into Asia Minor and, and they preached the word there um, to none but to the Jews only they only preached to the Jews hmm. and some of them were uh, that were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were coming to Antioch, Cyrene, just a place uh, where we would call Libya now, uh, on the coast of Africa there, right on the edge. Um, when they were come to Antioch, spoke unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So we've gone from the Jews to speak to the Greeks. So the word is spreading, and the Lord is using what's gone on the persecution that was there. We would sit there and say, the persecution is awful. We, I don't want persecution to come to America. It's already here. <laughs> it's just going to get worse. We haven't seen the, the extent of it. We're just starting to see the beginnings of it. We're starting to see the laws already be in place against churches and against Christians. And we're going to see more of it. But the persecution wasn't there to kill them or destroy them. The persecution was there so the word could spread to other places 
I'm figuring mine's going to be in jail, so I'm, let's go. <laughs> you can come with me, Frank. We'll have a bunk together here. <laughs> uh, so they, they came and, and they, they, they came to the Greeks and they were preaching the Lord Jesus because that's the only name under heaven by which men can be saved. So we preach the name of Jesus. We give out the name of Jesus. We proclaim, we herald the name of Jesus wherever we are because that's the only name that matters. Our names don't matter. Peter's name didn't matter. Jesus' name matters. He's the Messiah. He's the one that's come to save all of mankind. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. It doesn't say everybody believed, but many believed. When we speak, not everybody's going to believe that Jesus loves them. And they turned to the Lord. They turned from the direction they were going, and they came to the Lord. You can't believe without turning from your own way. And you can't turn to going God's way without believing first. You have to believe first before you can turn. That's why those words are in that order in your Bibles. The Holy Spirit writing this. It wasn't man that wrote this. We'd screw it up. <laughs> it would come out like Cinderella or something. This is so much greater, so much better, so much more wonderful that, that we need to have that. They believed and then they turned. And these tidings uh, of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Remember Barnabas, the one, the man whose name means son of comfort or son of consolation. He was with the apostles. He was uh, one who started bringing in things to, to help people that were in need. He was one who was always consoling. And so they sent him out. They sent him forth that he should go as far as Antioch into this Gentile area. Uh, we'll, send, we'll send Barnabas. He, he's an evangelist. He wants to go out. He wants to speak these things. And it says, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad. He saw the grace of God because he saw the work of God. He saw God's people starting to change and he knew it was by the grace of god that they changed it wasn't because of the law that they changed it was because of grace that they changed grace will change us more than the law will ever change us i could sit up here and say you shall not you shall not you shall do you shall do and it won't change your heart one little bit but once you see the grace of god you have to change that's what changes us, is his grace and his mercy and his love. It isn't our law. It isn't what we have to do and what we get to do. It doesn't change hearts. We see whole denominations of people who are told over and over, this is what you have to do. This is how you have to do it. And this is when you have to do it. We'll give you the day that you have to do it. Our hearts change because we see the grace of God and we fall in love with him and it changes us instantly. Your language changes. Your thoughts change. Your direction changes. Everything about you changes. Even the people you hang out with changes. You wouldn't be here unless you were changed. Who would want to hang out with a bunch of people like us? I mean, look around. Look at these people. <laughs> look at us. We're here because God changed us. And he continues to want to change us. <laughs> when he came and he had seen the grace of God, he was glad. He, he was just excited about what was God was doing. Uh, he had seen these things. And, and he exhorted them all that with the purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. We purpose in our hearts to cleave to the things of the Lord. Notice it doesn't say that we would cleave to the law, but that we would cleave to the Lord. We want to draw near to the things of the Lord and fasten ourselves on the things of the Lord. Not just to see them and to know them and be able to speak them, but we ourselves cleave to those things and hang on to the things of the Lord more and more and more. And I got to tell you, you guys have been such a blessing and this church has been such a blessing to me that I thought I was walking with the Lord before I got here. But now that I'm here and teaching in doing these things, in really being accountable for all of you before the Lord, that just really caused me to fasten on him more and more and more. And I'm so grateful for that. 
because the more I fasten on to the things of the Lord, the more I see his grace and his love, and the more I fall in love with him, and the more I fall in love with God's people. And it's so sweet, it's so wonderful to have this privilege. I called a guy the other day from, from Calvary of Philly, uh, uh, and was talking with him about getting hooked up in association with uh, the folks from Philly and, and the, the folks around the area that are associated with him. Uh, and uh, he was just talking about, and he was calling me sir. It's just like, really? You're calling me sir? <laughs> What's wrong with you? You don't know me, do you? <laughs> but but it, it just hit me all of a sudden, I, and I even told him, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to teach, to be able to be here, that I just can't stand it. It's just amazing to me. I'm just amazed at, at the grace of God that anybody would even show up. And he goes, I know. I don't know if he said that because he did know me or if he said that be, <laughs> because he experiences that too. I don't know. But anyway, the grace of God that they would cleave to the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. Barnabas was a good man, but he was good because he was full of the Holy Ghost. He wasn't good so that the Holy Ghost filled him. He was good because the Holy Ghost had already filled him. And now he was good. <laughs> We're not good without the Lord. And he was full of faith. He was faithful. That's what faithful means, is that you're full of faith. You're trusting in the Lord. You're walking with him. And you're, you're walking in faith, believing what you're not seeing. Believing the word of God for what it is. That he is going to complete that good work that he's begun in you. And when you start doing that, you become full of faith. God, you're really doing this, aren't you? You're faithful. You're full of faith of believing God. And much people was added unto the Lord. People were coming to salvation. And then Barnabas departed to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And, and, and this is kind of interesting. We, we got a couple seconds here. Um, that, that word seek, it's only used twice by Luke in the Gospel of Luke. And then here uh, in the book of Acts, uh, just in this one place, it's only used two times by him. And the word is anazitio. I, I know I killed it, but that's all right. Uh, you you can do with whatever you, you want with it. Uh, but that word means to just grab a hold of a wholehearted search. It's not just a little search. It's a wholehearted search. The other time he uses it is in the Gospel of Luke. Um, in there, uh, in chapter 2, it's when Mary and Joseph have left Jerusalem after the holy days, and they got three days down the street, and they realized they lost God. <laughs> oh, I thought you had Jesus. No, I don't have Jesus. I thought you had Jesus. As they check with all the rest of the relatives and realize that Jesus isn't there, they go back to Jerusalem, and there's a wholehearted search. That's the only other time Luke uses this word this way. There was a frantic search for Jesus. They frantically search for him. And here he seeks for Saul because he realizes that the Lord wants to use Saul and he frantically searches for him so that he can be minister to him and bring him to a place of being used by him, being used by the Lord. There's a search going on as Barnabas seeks the things for the people of God for their betterment. And really, that should be our heart when we come in here. We as believers don't come into a church so that we can get something from God. We're supposed to be here to give something to the rest of the body because he's already saved us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. We come in using our gifts for the body of Christ to show the rest of the body what God can do and what God has done. We should be frantically searching on how we can minister one to another. And that's what Barnabas is doing. And the Holy Spirit uses that word for the second time uh, that, that Luke would use it. The only two times in, in his books that he, that he does this. And it says, and when he had found him, the search paid off. Uh, and when he gets a hold of him, he brings him back to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And this, the disciples were called Christians 
first in Antioch, Christ ones, the Christ followers is really the, the interpretation of it. We're Christ followers. We're the image bearers of Christ. Uh, and they were first called that in Antioch, in this place that's up towards Asia Minor. Uh, and it's interesting here, too. We've gone through this whole chapter almost, and, and we're almost there, so don't fall asleep yet. Uh, hang on just a minute here. But he uses three different ways of teaching in this chapter of what really needs to happen for believers in Christ. Uh, it tells us first in verse 20, if you look back a little bit, uh, at the end of that verse that it says they were preaching the Lord Jesus. So first there's the preaching. Uh, and then we see, um, uh, oh boy, uh, do, 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 do. I just lost it. What did I do with it? Oh, yes, thank you. In verse, in verse 23, that there was exhortation. When he saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them. So there's an exhortation that takes place, but that exhortation can only take in place in people who are believers. And then down in verse 26, uh, it says that after they were saved, they were in the church, that he teaches them. There's three different things that, that should come about with the word of God. There should be the preaching of the word to bring salvation to people's hearts, to bring a change to their lives, preaching to encourage them to come to faith and to walk with him. And then there's an exhortation for them to then enter into that. And then there's the teaching of the word, which brings about the fullness of the word to the people's hearts. Those three things should happen every time we read and every time we teach. I know that some believe that you can just have a preaching service which is okay for unbelievers, but it's not going to edify the church. It's not going to build up the church. The exhortation is going to do that and the teaching of the word, the completing of the word in their hearts and their lives. Those three things should happen for us all the time as we go through. The preaching of the word should come to our hearts as we read to realize that we need a change because we're always going to need to be changed. And then an exhortation from the Holy Spirit for us to then enter into it. And then the teaching of the word just to round it, round it up and, and complete it and bring uh, an understanding to our hearts of what it really does, of what is going to happen. And in one chapter, we see all three kinds coming to play. And it says that in those days, verse 27, uh, came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, we'll see him again, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world. And it came to pass in the days of um, Claudius Caesar. So uh, after he proclaims this, after he prophesies this, it comes to pass later. You can tell if a prophet is real or not if it comes to pass. If somebody comes up and say, I have a prophecy for you, you don't believe it right away. You believe it when it comes to pass. <laughs> and it came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren which dwelled in Judea. As they heard the word, they were moved by the word. They were moved by the things that were going to happen. And it says that, that those that were disciples, those that were being discipled by the Holy Spirit, discipled into becoming a Christian and being a Christian and walking in those ways according to his ability, not according to what somebody else wanted. Because we see people now who come up, come up and say that you have to give. You know, I, I feel in the audience there's three people who are going to give $1,000 to the Billy O'Dell Ferrari Fund. I feel it. I, I know that you're there. I know that you're doing it. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> that is not what it says. It says they came according to their ability, what they could do. They had to maintain their families. They needed to maintain what they had already to keep their businesses going. They had to maintain the things that were already there. But if they had an ability to give above and beyond that, they did. And sometimes there's that, that relief that goes on. For those of you that give the, to the Samaritan's Purse, uh, that's pretty much what is going on here. According to your ability, you give outside uh, to others who are in need. 
and you give those things according to your ability. They determined to send relief to the brethren that dwelled in Judea. Uh, and we see Paul in his epistles, how he came to collect that offering and bring it back to Jerusalem. And he brought a, a couple of people with him just to make sure he was accountable, just to make sure he wasn't skimming off the top and uh, wanted everybody to know that, that he hadn't touched it. He, he said in, in his epistles that he wanted the monies ready when he got there. And when he got there, he left with it and with the other people so that there would be no opportunity for him to take from it and, and to do something else with it. But he wanted it ready. And when he was talking to the Corinthian church, he, he spoke about that. Have it ready before I get there so that when I get there, we can just take it and we can deliver it to Jerusalem so that there, there can be no rumors or reports that that anything else had gone on with that money. There's an accountability in there. And it's wonderful when God's people are accountable to others so that those things can't happen in their lives. It was determined to send relief to the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it by the elders to the hands, by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Uh, so we see that it's coming from Barnabas and Saul and it was coming back to Jerusalem. But just this wonderful picture of what happened with Peter and uh, what he had done in the, the way that he ministered to the people is just so wonderful. The, the sweetness, he's grown in grace. He's grown in the knowledge of who God is and he's grown in grace just to minister to the people. But he encouraged them once he showed them. And they entered into it with him. They were of one heart, one mind. Yes, this is the word of the Lord, and it's a blessing to us, and we, and we want God's word. That's what God's word can do, and God's grace can do in our lives and in the lives of those that are around us. And that's what we want it to do. But it first has to start with us. Lord, do I have grace in my heart towards others, or do I want them to be like me? <laughs> or do I want them to be like Jesus? And then can we give them the word of God and pray for them and exhort them to bring them into that place. And I think it's so important in the world today because there's not much of the church that's even giving out the word of God. As one pastor said, we got little sermonettes for Christianettes <laughs> who never grow into anything. We need the complete word of God, the whole counsel of God given out. Hang on to your Bibles. This word is going to become so precious. I've got, I, I love the Schofield Bible. It's just my preference. It doesn't mean it's better than any other Bible. It's just the one that I like the best. I've got another one that's still in the wrapper in my house because I know one day these Bibles aren't going to be available. Mm -hmm. It's got to be in our hearts, in our minds. And if you can have a spare, keep a spare there. I'm not trying to scare you. I just want to encourage you, get the word in you. Oh, it's so sweet, it's so precious, it'll do so much work that we can't do on our own, that we can't do to anybody else, only the Holy Spirit can do in us. <laughs> so Father, we're just th thankful, Lord, for your word. What a precious gift your word is to us, Lord. We see the grace working in Peter and we realize that you've changed his heart and changed his ways. We, we see the, the boldness of Peter to minister to those around him without rebuking him, just graciously giving them hope and change for their own lives. And Father, we want to be able to do that with others. We don't want to force them into changing. We want them to change because you changed them. But Lord, help us to know your word and have your word to give it out. So we're just so thankful tonight, Lord, that we have it, that we still have a place to meet. And Father, we're thankful that your goodness and your grace is still being poured out on this world. So thank you for that, Lord. May many come to salvation because of your work. May you be glorified, Lord, in anything that we do. May it not be for our glory, but for your glory, Lord. We love you. We thank you. Uh, and we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.